be good. All right, well, thanks for having me again. I'm Joe Minardi. I'm an emergency physician, and you're going to get sick of me next semester when we do ultrasound every other week in the, in the lab. And this is the first time we've done this um, in this course, is showing you how to assess some um, cardiovascular physiology with ultrasound. Um, if you have slides, there's minor updates on these, but nothing major. I did put my uh, Twitter handle up there. Sometimes I post you know, clues, key points that might show up later on Twitter, so you can look for that. And, uh, but let's jump right in and get started. So the things we're going to go through today, and this is all big picture stuff, right? So if there's some fancy word up there and you're like, what is that word? I need to remember it. Don't worry about it. Don't type it. Don't write it down. No one's going to ask you about these uh, fancy words, big picture stuff, okay? What I want you to do is recognize one, just how we can use ultrasound to assess physiology non-invasively. And I'll show you some flow patterns of uh, the arteries, the veins, using Doppler analysis. Um, and then the cardiac physiology, the cardiac cycle, and some of the Doppler correlates. And we'll get to how we can use that to help us assess patients. But big picture stuff. Why ultrasound? I always have to say this stuff. Ultrasound is fast. You can see it's portable. I can bring it right to your room, right to your bedside, wherever you are. We can carry small ones in our pockets to Rwanda or wherever we might want to go. It's non-invasive. Uh, you can repeat it as much as you want. It's completely safe. We do it on babies, right? And repeatable, cheap, that kind of thing. So that's why, that's why we're trying to teach it to all medical students, and hopefully one day it'll be standard in every medical school curriculum. You guys are ahead in most of the country. So I'm going to start off by just introducing you to a couple of cases, and then at the end we're going to come back to these cases and see how ultrasound might help us. So this first one is a 58-year-old male who's got leg pain and swelling. Looks slightly abnormal. And this next one, 64-year-old male who has right leg pain, but the leg is kind of pale, but it hurts. And then we've got a 38-year-old male, short of breath, doesn't know why, can't chase down criminals like he used to. And then we have a common scenario that we see in our ICUs and emergency departments, someone who's confused, hypotensive, critically ill, and we need some guidance on how to best manage them, what kind of medications or fluids or things we might want to do. So that's our intro. So, and you guys haven't learned any ultrasound yet, so I have to tell you at least what ultrasound is. Remember, big picture, not, not gritty details. This is it, in a nutshell, we use sound waves, high frequency sound waves. We send those sound waves into the tissues. The sound waves bounce off of our tissues and they give us pictures. Very similar to how a bat locates a moth that it might want to eat or avoids a tree that it doesn't want to run into or how some of our ships might map the seafloor, things like that. So that's, that's all this is. And that's about as detailed as we're going to get about it until next semester. Uh, we, instead of using our voices or a ship, we use probes, and we have a machine that gives us pictures. And just a little bit about what these pictures mean and what they look like. So, and we'll look at these pictures again. So this is the heart, this is the left ventricle, and we're seeing the mitral valve and the aortic valve here. And the blood inside the left ventricle is black. That, that's all I really want you to know is blood looks black, other stuff is some shade of gray, okay? So the tissue, the ventricle, the muscles, gray. And here's a different orientation of the heart where left ventricle's here, right ventricle's here. This is the right atrium, the left, the right atrium and the left atrium. And we see we're using color Doppler to see blood flow moving through the heart. Here's the carotid artery, the common carotid branching to the internal and external carotid. The blood inside the artery is black. That's all you need to know. Blood looks black, other stuff is gray, okay? Uh, internal jugular vein, so right in here and carotid artery in cross-section. Doppler effect. So depending on your love for country music, a train analogy is good. If you don't like country music, then you can pretend it's a jet plane. But we use the Doppler effect in ultrasound to help us assess blood flow. And you all know the, uh, the analogy of the moving train as it comes towards you, it sounds higher pitched. And as it moves away from you, it sounds lower pitched because the sound waves get spread out or get compressed moving towards or away. The same thing happens with red blood cells that are moving through the heart or through blood vessels. Blood vessels that are moving towards our transducer push the sound waves closer together and increase the frequency. And we can measure that and detect that to help us measure how fast those red blood cells are moving. 
red blood cells moving away from our transducer, spread the sound waves out, lower the frequency, we can measure velocity. All you really need to know is that Doppler lets us measure velocity and direction of blood flow, and it lets us do that over time. And so from that, we can estimate and make um, calculations about a lot of physiology. Key words that repeat themselves over and over tend to come up on exam questions later on. So the Doppler effect allows us to measure blood flow direction and velocity over time. So here we have blood flow moving in and out of the heart. Now this is color Doppler. We're not going to talk a whole bunch about this today. This gives us a big box with kind of rough estimates of flow and direction and speed. What we're going to talk a lot about is spectral Doppler. So this is where we use this little tiny gate. We place it in an area of interest to get very specific information about velocity and direction. So let's, uh, again, reminders, what's it do? It allows us to measure velocity, direction over time. And I'm just going to zoom right into this. So this is a common carotid artery. We've put this Doppler gate in here to measure the velocity and direction of this blood flow. The blood flow is moving in this direction. Our transducer is at the top. So the blood flow moves towards our transducer. That's why it's red. Red is up here. If it was going the other way, it would look blue down here. And now we can map that over time. So this is a graph. The y-axis is time. Or the x-axis is time. And the y-axis is velocity. So over here we see velocities, 100 centimeters per second. And this is an artery, so it pulses. So we get a rapid increase in velocity during systole. And then during diastole, we have a much lower blood flow velocity, and then it spikes again with each systolic cycle. And it's all moving in this direction, more towards our transducer, or it would be below. So see these numbers are negative. That would be blood flow moving away from our transducer. These numbers are positive, blood flow moving towards our transducer. That's super specific. You don't need to get super detailed about it. And I just zoomed in to show you again. Baseline is zero, towards, away and velocity spectrum. We can make lots of analyses about this, and you can really, if you really want to, you can really geek out about this data, right? You have velocities, you can calculate averages, you can calculate pulsatility indices, and you can figure out a lot about what's going on inside blood vessels and in the heart. We're going to, again, we're going to stick to big picture basic items today. So arteries, the first thing we're going to talk about, when we put this Doppler gate into arteries, the blood flow should look pulsatile, right? And you don't need a Doppler to tell you that. You can feel your pulse. It's pulsatile. It accelerates rapidly, and then it comes down during diastole until the next systolic cycle. Uh, a key point that I want you to understand is the difference between high resistance and low resistance blood vessels and blood flow. And this changes depending on the blood vessel, depending on the physiologic conditions. And I'm going to show you some examples and show you how we recognize differences and changes to help us figure out what's going on with patients. And let's just get into an example. So here's an example of kind of an ultra high resistance or highly pulsatile flow. So sometimes people will refer to resistance as pulsatility. They kind of mean the same thing. But what you see is really what I remember and how I remember it is high resistance is big sharp spikes and nothing in between, not much of anything in between. So if you remember it that way, it'll be easy. Really rapid acceleration, so really rapidly gets to a high velocity, comes down really rapidly. In really high resistance vessels, you get reversal of flow, so it goes the opposite direction briefly during um, diastole. You get diastolic, or not, not diastole, but you get flow reversal during systole, then you get the dichrotic notch. And here, during diastole, there's almost no flow at all. So this is high resistance. And then low resistance flow, you see this kind of more broad. Upstroke is still pretty sharp, but this peak is more broad. It gradually comes down, and we still see significant velocity during the diastolic period. So that's low resistance flow. Now, a lot of vessels are somewhere in between, right? So here's an example of one that's somewhere in between. We have pretty sharp spikes. We have... We don't quite have flow reversal. We get the dichrotic notch, but we still have some flow during diastole. So this is somewhere in between. So they're not all one or the other. 
So high resistance. Extremities at rest have high resistance. Your external carotids have pretty high resistance. Um, and here's one of my favorite examples. You guys haven't done GI phys yet, right? You don't need to. This is vascular. So this is the superior mesenteric artery. It feeds a lot of your gut, right? If you are fasting, who's fasting now? No one. Every one breakfast. If you're fasting, the arterial waveform in your superior mesenteric artery looks kind of like this. High resistance, flow reversal, very low flow during diastole. But when you eat the exercise of your gut, you get a different waveform. So this is the same artery. We get a rapid upstroke, but we don't get as much flow reversal and we have much higher velocity during diastole because when your gut is digesting food, it demands more blood supply, and so it changes its resistance patterns. To me, that's just cool. Uh, other low resistance examples, internal carotid. Your inter internal carotid artery feeds your brain. Your brain needs pretty constant supply of blood flow, so it has low resistance. The kidneys also are blood flow hogs, testicles, ovaries. They need constant blood flow or they die pretty quickly. So they have low resistance flow so that they always get a good blood supply. So what I kind of remember in my head is high resistance have sharp peaks and low diastolic flow. These are things that can tolerate intermittent flow, so like your extremities at rest. And then low resistance, broad peaks, continuous diastolic flow, go to structures that need continuous flow, like your brain. Does that make sense? All right, so high or low? Everybody said high, good. High or low? Low. Now this stuff down at the bottom here is an artifact that we'll learn more about next semester. But yes, low resistance. We see diastolic flow all the way, really broad, gradual. So you guys got that. You got arterial flow resistance. All right. So how do we approach this clinically? History and physical exam is always the first thing we got to do. So no matter how much technology we talk about in lab tests, the most important decisions you make are still based on history and physical exam. And the, but these tools help us add information to that. So we look for flow. First off, we want to know, is there blood flow present or absent in the artery we're worried about? And then if it's, if it's absent, we know that's bad. Uh, if it's present, we want to know if it's normal or abnormal. We characterize it further. And that's pretty much it for arteries. Questions on arteries at all? So you can probably already guess that veins are a little different, right? We know from some of the things you've learned already that veins are capacitance vessels. They're passive. They're not as elastic. Um, they don't contract as much as arteries, but they store lots of, lots of our, um, our, our body's blood volume. And you can kind of break them down into peripheral and central veins. So peripheral, think about things that are far away from the right atrium, and central veins are ones that are kind of close in this area to the right atrium. And we'll show you what some of these waveforms might look like. So this is the portal vein. So the portal vein... Now, it's a little bit different, but for the most part, it acts a lot like a peripheral vein. It's far away from the right atrium. The blood has to go through another capillary bed before it gets into a central vein and heads to the right atrium. So you can see its waveform is pretty flat. It's not 100% flat, but it's pretty flat. It certainly doesn't look like an artery, right? Uh, this is a tiny little vein in a testicle, really far away from the right atrium, really flat waveform. Right? There's not a lot of changes in the velocity in testicular, testicular veins. Ovary, ovarian veins would look very similar. Um, but they do have, they react, right? They're, they're capacitance vessels. They don't have a lot of their own um, smooth muscles, so they kind of do, they react to other things around them. So two of the things that we'll look at and how these veins react to the rest of the environment are phasicity and augmentation. And I'm going to show you some examples. Phasicity is the change in velocity in response to respiration breathing. And augmentation is an increase in velocity in response to external pressure. And I'll show you that, what that looks like. So here we've got, we put Doppler into the, port, the uh, popliteal vein. So kind of behind the knee, right? And we can see it's not perfectly flat. We see some kind of slow, gradual changes in velocity. And that's just changes that happen as you breathe. So as you breathe and your diaphragm moves up and down, your intra-abdominal pressure changes. That pressure 
kind of squeezes or lets the veins collapse, and so that changes the velocity in the veins. So your respiration affecting your veins all the way down your leg. Arteries don't do this so much. So that's phasicity, and this is augmentation. So what augmentation is, and this is a common example, we put the Doppler gate into our popliteal vein, so really about behind the knee. If we squeeze down lower on the calf, we squirt the blood up our leg, increasing its velocity transiently, and we get a big spike in our Doppler spectrum. So here's the blood flow, we squeeze, and then this big spike. So increased velocity from squeezing distally. That's a normal venous physiology characteristic. Questions on that? Yes? So that might make you think there's something in the way, like a clot or some other obstruction. So we use that to assess, and I'll show you in the examples later. And if we don't see the changes from respiration, we think there's some obstruction upstream, like a clot or a mass tumor, something like that. Um, central veins, so we're going to show you what they look like. Again, this is really just the veins reacting to their external environment. The, the right atrium, there's lots of pressure changes going on in the right atrium, as you guys have learned about during the cardiac cycle. So the veins that are close to that, the pressure and the velocities change in those veins that are emptying there. You, you can still see phasicity and augmentation here. It's a little harder to appreciate because there's just so much other stuff going on in these veins. Uh, but here's what it might look like. So this is Doppler in a hepatic vein. Hepatic veins are drained from the liver into the inferior vena cava right to the right atrium. So they're very close to the right atrium. And we see this central venous waveform. Sometimes people see this and mistake it for an arterial waveform. But it's not an arterial waveform. We do have multiple peaks, but they're not as sharp. Their velocities aren't as high. And we... The way I remember it is we just see kind of a series of peaks, like basically two peaks at a time, maybe three if you want to count this one, and then a gradual in-between period. That's a central venous waveform. And I'm not going to quiz you right now about the different ones. I just want you to see the difference between those waveforms. So again, when we're worried about vein pathology, same, similar clinical approach. First we look at the patient to see what the clinical findings are, then we can apply ultrasound to get some more detailed information if we think we need it. Is flow absent or present? If it's present, is it normal or not? And then we can characterize it. So just reminders. So over on your left, you got two pictures on your left. Is that central or peripheral? And on the right? Central. Good. Could come up again. Um, what are we uh, demonstrating here? So I'll give you a, a two-point two multiple choice. Is this phasicity or augmentation? Phasicity. And the other one? Augmentation. Good. You guys are going to ace this stuff. All right. Questions on arteries or veins? Now let's get to my favorite subject in ultrasound, the heart. So the heart. The principles are similar. There's blood flow moving through the heart. The difference is it changes quickly, and there's different phases to the cycle and multiple currents of flow. So in an artery, it's pretty much going one direction the whole time, marching along. In a vein, it's pretty much chugging along like a lazy river. But in the heart, it goes one direction, then it shoots the other direction, and things change a lot. So we're going to look at that. And we're going to look at a couple of pictures. And again, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to necessarily memorize this, but I want you to understand what we're looking at. So we're going to look at, one, a parasternal long axis view of the heart. Don't remember that. Just pay attention to what it looks like. This is the left ventricle, this whole big chamber here, okay? This is a picture correlate to the same thing. So this is the left atrium. This is the mitral valve. And this is the aortic valve. So the blood flows in through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, then out through the aortic valve, into the aortic root. That's what you need to know about this one. And then we take Doppler measurements from this apical four-chamber view, where this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle, and this is the right side of the heart. 
So we'll get Doppler tracings from this, but I'll show you images of the other picture, okay? And the reason we do this is because we can tilt here and we can actually get a view where we see the mitral valve and the aortic valve right close to each other. And the blood flow, I'll just get to the blood flow. Blood flow goes in vertical directions on our screen. When we do Doppler measurements, we like vertical blood flow in the heart. That's why we get Doppler measurements from here. Not really that important why for now, but that's why we do the two different things. All right, so peristernal long axis. Blood flow goes that direction. For what we're doing in the heart, it's hard to get Doppler tracings from blood going in that direction. That's why we don't do that. All right, so let's correlate the cardiac cycle with echo. So here we can watch the cardiac cycle happening, right? And you'll do this next semester, and hopefully you think it's cool. I think it's cool to be able to see what our heart's doing in our chest. Now when we do our Doppler measurements, we stick the gate down here and we get a tracing that looks somewhat like this. This is the blood flow going away from our transducer out the aorta, out the aortic valve. So this is systole, and that's what we have here, systole. Systolic blood flow moving away from our transducer. And here are the parts of diastole, the blood flow moving into the left ventricle towards our transducer to give us these waveforms, okay? And we're gonna break that down a little bit more. So the next thing we're gonna do is correlate it with uh, some of the graphs from your Wigger's diagram where we see left ventricular pressure, aortic pressure, we see ventricular volume and the EKG tracing. Now here are the Doppler velocity tracing. So this is systolic tracing and these are the diastolic peaks, okay? Again, Doppler right in the middle of the left ventricle. And you guys have studied this immensely, right? You guys have this memorized, Wigger's diagram? All right, so we're gonna start with atrial systole. So it starts about right here. And I'm gonna try not to mess it up too much. Right here, at atrial systole where the atrium contracts, increases the velocity of the blood going into the left ventricle, we get this little spike in velocity that we see with our Doppler gate. And you can see where it correlates with the EKG. It's right before the rise in uh, left, ventric left ventricular pressure and correlated over here with your diagram. Does everybody see that? Does that make sense? At the end, we'll go through the whole thing at once and I'll ho hopefully show it to you that way too. So next phase is the isovolumetric contraction. So the mitral valve is closed. You can see here, mitral valve is closed. The aortic valve is closed. And we're getting ready to start increasing pressure in the left ventricle, but the, the valve, it's against closed valves at this moment. So there's really no, if you look at the velocity, there's almost like zero velocity of blood flow moving in the left ventricle. And then next up, don't do that to me. Oh man. Next we're gonna see diastole or systole. So we get to, so they're just backing up. So atrial contraction, increased velocity of blood flow in the left ventricle, isovolumetric contraction, almost no velocity. And then we get the systolic ejection period. So we can look here, we see a big velocity going away from us as the blood is squirted out the aortic root. And we can see here the mitral valve is closed. And it's a little hard to see here, but those, those little leaflets, they're open. So they're just like, they close like this, they open like that. And the blood flow is exiting the aortic root, okay? So that's what it looks like. Then next up, we're gonna back up to a beginning part of the cardiac cycle, is the beginning of diastole, isovolumetric relaxation, aortic valve closed, mitral valve closed, 
velocity around zero on our Doppler tracing because the blood, blood's not really moving in the heart at this point. And then next up is the E wave. It's my favorite wave for some reason. I have no idea why. But it's the early filling part. So this is where the pressure in the ventricle was so low that the blood just rushes in when that valve opens. So the mitral valve opens really wide, and this is kind of important, opens really wide, the blood flow empties rapidly, and then it starts to slow down a little bit. You see this velocity decreasing, and that's early filling. And then I'll go right to diastasis. So this is where the pressure has started to equilibrate a little bit. The mitral valve is partially closed. See how it's not quite as open now, but the atrial contraction hasn't happened yet. And then as we move forward, see that mitral valve open up again as the atrium contracts and squeezes more blood flow through it. But it doesn't open as big as it did the first time. So early filling, it opens big. Atrial contraction opens, but not quite as big. And let's just, actually I think the next one, we'll just play it through here. That makes sense to everyone? I think it's super cool. And something I didn't mention before, but one of the reasons we do this, all the pressure tracings you see and you learn about, measuring left ventricular pressure and those waveforms you see, how do you think you get those? For the most part, you get those by threading a catheter into someone's heart. Well, most patients don't like that if we can avoid it. Um, so when we can estimate these things by looking at velocities with Doppler non-invasively, it's much better for our patients and it's easier for us. To me, that's the coolest thing about it is we can estimate these physiologic parameters non-invasively quickly at the bedside. Does that make sense to everyone, this correlates? All right. So, all right, that's the big picture stuff. Uh, these other things I want to show you are concept items primarily. Uh, I want you to understand, but not, not the details too much. So Doppler. So we, you saw before, if we go back to this previous slide, we kind of stuck this Doppler gate right in the middle of the left ventricle where we're kind of picking up blood flow going this direction, but we're also picking up blood flow going in this direction. But we can be very specific and put that wherever we want. We can put it right at the edge of the mitral valve and just pick up that blood flow, or we can put it right at the aortic valve and to pick up that blood flow and get really specific information about that. So what we can do, and I think this also can give us lots of information, we can zoom in on this area and get an image that looks kind of like this. This is the left ventricular outflow tract. I don't know if you guys use that terminology so far. And it just means this is where all the blood flow goes. All of your cardiac output at some point has to go through here during the cardiac cycle. Immediately after this, it starts going off into the coronary arteries and other arteries. So that's, this is your only real chance to see what's going on with your total cardiac output at the left ventricular outflow tract. So we can measure this diameter, which is kind of useful. Even more useful is if we know that diameter, and then we stick a Doppler gate right at that same exact spot, we can get specific tracings and velocity profiles about the blood flow in the cardiac cycle. So this is a tracing from the left ventricular outflow tract, the velocity. And if we trace that and we use some calculus, and I'll ask you guys for a formula later, we can get something that's called the velocity time integral. Please don't remember that word. But with that calculation, we can estimate stroke volume, non-invasively, completely just with sound waves. I think that's cool. If we use stroke volume and we know heart rate, we can calculate cardiac output. Even more interesting, and you'll have to calculate a bunch of this stuff on the test that I give you later, is the Bernoulli equation, where we can take, all you need to know from this is we can use velocities that we measure in the heart or elsewhere to estimate pressures, like filling pressures. Is the ventricle filled enough, overfilled, underfilled, things like that. I'm not going to ask you this. Please don't think I am. Um, 
But this is some of the non-invasive physiology characteristics that we can measure using Doppler. So this, this is the take home point, right? Non-invasive measures of cardiovascular physiology that can help us take care of patients. Um, so just a little quiz. So right here, A, B, C, D, E, or F. This is systolic ejection. Velocity increases during systole, so this is F. And then this is, so isovolumetric contraction, early filling, atrial systole, isovolumetric relaxation, and then back to systole again. Or isovolumetric contraction, did I say that right? Review that waveform. All right, the approach, assessing history and physical, apply ultrasound. Now, I've showed you a lot of things using Doppler tracings and Doppler gates and waveforms, but I want to show you something that's, I think, probably almost as interesting or maybe more interesting than that is that a lot of things you can evaluate just using your eyeballs, right? You can put ultrasound on an artery, on the heart, on a vein, and you can figure out a lot about the physiology just by looking at it and seeing what's going on with it. If you see a big distended vein and it's got clot in it, then you know the physiology is of an obstructed vein. You don't even need to put Doppler on it. So use your eyeballs first, then you apply Doppler to take a look at some of this stuff. So these are some images of what some normal hearts should look like. So you guys have never, who's ever seen an echo before? So, okay, a fair number of you. So maybe you've seen this on my Twitter feed, I don't know. Is this normal? No Doppler, nothing, no measurements. This is not normal, right? Here's a comparison to normal left ventricle. We can see a big change in volume during systole, whereas on this side, there's not a lot of volume change. Those walls just kind of sit there and wiggle at you. So we can look at this and we can tell that the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is high and this ventricle is overfilled, this left ventricle is failing. Just using our eyeballs, no Doppler, no measurements, no, no nothing. So use your eyeballs first. So how about this one? Normal, abnormal? Those ventricular walls, they slap together during each systolic phase. So the pressure in this left ventricle is low. So this is a hyperdynamic left ventricle. Again, using our eyeballs, we can figure out the physiology of the heart in a lot of scenarios. So left ventricle here, left ventricle here. So what's wrong with these? So in these cases, these ventricles are being compressed here by a large fluid collection, pericardial fusion. Again, we use our eyeballs to tell us what the physiology of the heart is. Here, the left ventricle is being compressed by a dilated, overpressurized right ventricle. And just looking at this right ventricle, we can estimate that the pressure in the right ventricle is too high. And that's why it's dilated. No Doppler, no measurements. Just get a picture of it. All right, so we use history and physical exam first. We apply ultrasound, eyeballs, then we can use Doppler parameters and correlate. Does that make sense? Questions for that? All right, let's get back to our cases real quick. So our 58-year-old male, this is a very extreme case, uh, but it illustrates it well. Left leg pain, swelling, and we do some ultrasound on this person to figure out what's going on with them. Oh, my videos don't work. All right, well, I'll tell you about them. So this is the right side. This is the artery, and this is the vein. And you really, even without the video, you can see some things. On the left side, this is the artery and this is the vein. What's the difference between those veins? So this one's way bigger than this one is, right? So that's a, that's a clue already. We can estimate physiology just by looking at a picture of it. It's too big because there's high pressure. And then when we put Doppler on it, this is the normal side. What's this called? Where do we get these velocity changes probably as they're breathing? Basicity, right? On this side, we put Doppler in this vein, and what do we see? We see a loss of phasicity. So this leads us to conclude that there's a clot up above that area that we're looking at. And this person has an iliac thrombus making their leg look terrible, and hopefully none of your legs ever look like that. 
Uh, next example. So our next patient is the 64-year-old male with right leg pain. The leg, the leg is kind of cool, pale. And we do some Doppler analyses on this person. And we see, so this is in the femoral artery. This is a pretty normal femoral arterial tracing. Fairly high resistance, a little bit of flow reversal, low flow during diastole. And this is our Doppler tracing in the popliteal artery. Popliteal artery should look about the same as the femoral artery. It should be high resistance, the leg is at rest, but it's not the same, right? Is that high or low resistance? It's low resistance. So this tells us something is obstructing blood flow between here and here. So femoral, popliteal, there's an obstruction somewhere in between there. And we can look, look around further and we can probably find it. So abnormal tracing, and we can characterize it and tells us what's wrong with our patient. So they have an arterial obstruction. All right, next scenario, 30-year-old male, short of breath, doesn't know why, um, really no other symptoms, otherwise had been healthy. And we do echo, and we look. The left ventricle is failing. It's dilated. There's not a lot of change in volume throughout the cardiac cycle. So just looking at this, we know that this person has a dilated cardiomyopathy and the physiology of their left ventricle is altered. And we can do even more specific parameters measuring their LVOT, velocity time integral, and um, we can estimate a low cardiac output. Completely non-invasively, we can do this in a few minutes at the bedside if we want to. And then our last scenario is the 48-year-old confused hypotensive person in our ICU and we're really not sure why they're in shock, hypotensive, and we want to know what's the best next step in management. This comes up all the time in the ICUs. Should I give fluids or should I give basoactive uh, medications to increase their blood pressure? And if we look at them and we use ultrasound, we can see this is a hyperdynamic heart. It's emptying completely, so it needs more volume. And if we measure their cardiac output, we can measure that in response to giving them extra fluid, we see that it increases. So we know that this person needs fluid instead of norepinephrine or something like that. All right, so the summary again, you've, probably, you've heard me say this already. Non-invasive evaluation of cardiovascular physiology. We can estimate blood flow velocity and direction over time. Look at your patient first. Then look at the structures, look at, use your eyeballs to look at the heart, look at the vessels, and then you can apply Doppler. And remember these key things. Peripheral veins are kind of flattish and reactive with phasicity and augmentation. Central veins, they have a, uh, they mimic a right atrial waveform. Know the difference between a high and low resistance artery. And then the heart, recognize the cardiac cycle. Use your eyeballs to see what it looks like and know where to use Doppler. Questions on any of that? Okay, we're going to have uh, one of your colleagues come up and we're going to do a quick demo. <laughs>